sorry guys we have a little bit of a <clears> the <throat> um, background problem we'll wait a couple of minutes for everybody to join i saw a lot of people replied that they will join the the call so let's give them a few more minutes to to come here in the meantime uh if you could drop uh where where you're calling from in the chat that would be awesome or you can say as well where are you calling from So, yeah. Hello, Nitish. How are you? Hello, Clement. I hope I'm pronouncing your name well, correctly. Hello, Kenneth. Hello, Yuna. Uh, hello, Chion. Hello, Jay. Hello, Pablo. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can yeah. hear you. Hello, Marta. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Calling from Korea. I arrived three weeks ago already. Okay, wow. Where 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 are you from originally? Uh from where... France. Okay. How long are you staying in Korea for? Or well, I, I suppose for a long time if you're here on this yeah. call. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um I'll give everybody one more minute to come and join and then we can switch to some some more fun stuff. But in the meantime, I'll leave you with um, with a question. Um, what is the weather like? Where are you? Wh where you are right now? Make me envious. So Yuna is calling from Indonesia. So she is in a very warm place. Seoul is freezing, so it, yeah, no Seoul, difference from where you are. I, so I just got, I, I actually just arrived in Seoul. I, I, I came from Busan, where I live. Busan is pretty cold as well, but this is the next level of cold. Not fun. It was worse yesterday. I'm sorry? It was worse yesterday in terms of the cold. Oh, don't tell me. I am not designed for this weather. Okay, uh, I think I'll slowly start in that case. Um, in the meantime, I, I guess people will be coming in uh, as, as time goes by. So um, let me let me indeed share my screen uh, with you guys. <clears throat> but before I share my screen, I actually have um, a little task for you a little ice breaking game. So um, for some of you, it's gonna be super easy. For some of you, it's not gonna be that easy or some of you might surprise us. I want you to think for a second, uh, what is, um, hold on. Uh, Hold on, hold on a second. Uh, so I want you to uh, briefly think about what uh, what comes to my, to your mind when you hear startup ecosystem. Okay, I'm going to send you to breakout rooms for three minutes and you will have another person with you in the breakout room. So I want you to share what comes to your mind 
when you hear um uh when you when you hear the word or the phrase Korean startup ecosystem. So are you ready? I hope you're ready. Okay, see you later. Oh, Okay, throw it here. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. This is not the end of the game. So do you remember what the other person said what, about what they think the Korean startup ecosystem is for them? I want you to go to the chat here on Zoom, and we're going to do a waterfall, meaning that you have to type in what the other person said, that the Korean startup ecosystem is for them, but don't press send. Press send only when I tell you to go, okay? So write it down, think about, well, try to remember what the other person said. I hope you were listening to them. Write it down. And on the count of five, four, three, two, one, send. Wow. A lot of government support related stuff here. That's good. That's what we're going to talk about. And also, this is also part of a government support program, FYI. We're going to talk about that a little in a little while as well. Oh, we have Francisca joining here as well. That's awesome. We'll give her a second to, um, to get in. Because there's so few of us, I thought that uh, we'd go around and briefly introduce one another. Uh, so I'll start with myself. My name is Martha. I am a partner at South Ventures, a company based in Busan in South Korea. We help, uh, we work on social impact, but also we help foreign uh, entrepreneurs enter the Korean startup scene and establish their presence here. 
Uh, I'm also the the founder and the I guess main person in charge of Seoul Startups, the biggest international startup community in Korea. And I'm a, co a program director for a group called uh, Start to Group, where we help foreign startups expand globally, or not foreign startups, like startups from around the world expand globally. I would like to ask next Gion on my left to introduce himself as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Gion. I'm based in Seoul. Uh, I work with Marta for Start to Group and also um, SLS Ventures at the moment right now. And yes, very nice to meet you all. Awesome. Jay? Hello, my name is Jay. I also part of the SAS Ventures. I'm running, uh, doing uh, many things with Marta and Jian here. And then I will talk about the start of Visa uh, today as well. So yes, so nice to meet you everyone. Thanks for joining from all over the world. Thank you. So next on my roster is uh, Kenneth. Uh, oh, it's Kenneth, you mean me? Kenneth, oh yeah, sorry. Hey, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ken Chin. Uh, I already met Marta and Jay back in Oasis 4 last year in, in Busan, but now I'm working with currently an Australian Manuka honey company to try to bring their products to Korea. So that's uh, one of that's why, you know, there's a, maybe I should have done four plus instead of Oasis 4, given where things are headed now. But uh, but yeah, so that's why I'm interested in what we can do uh, or what I can learn and what type of government support we can get for uh, trying to bring that uh, venture to, to Korea. So. Well, definitely hook us on, on the product once once it's in here <laughs> or maybe even before you if you need testers. Um, <laughs> next, uh, Clement, how are you doing? Nice to meet you all. So I'm doing good. I'm a comp computer engineer. I'm thinking about starting a startup with a Korean entrepreneur about blockchain and this kind of technology. Awesome. That's a, that's a good country to be here in. Yeah. Next is uh, the next is Yuna calling from hot Indonesia. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Yuna Park from K Style Hub and the PT in the hands Jatra Hutama from uh, Indonesian company. Oh, actually, I have a company in Korea, but um, right now I'm working in an uh, Indonesian company also. So my partner wanted to uh, establish a startup in Indonesia, uh, in Korea. So I joined this program. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Chris from Equally Hot Singapore. Hi, Chris, if you could say a few words about yourself. Can you hear us, Chris? Hello, is it me or some, yes, some other Chris? Yes, it's you, it's you. <laughs> I got confused because you are now Singapore and I'm like, oh, there is another Chris around here. <laughs> no, 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 there's only one Chris that's in Singapore right now. Oh, and that's okay, uh, yeah. So hi everyone, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm representing uh, the building uh, uh, AI technology that enables thermal um, imaging for diagnosing uh, cardiovascular disease. And I'm happy to be part of uh, this program to explore more. Awesome. Uh, next is Pablo. Hi, hello, Pablo. Hi, hello, everyone. I'm Pablo. And I'm the founder of Manabu Dev. And also, I manage a few communities. I manage Manabu community. We are 10,000 members globally, focusing in Australia, wow. Taiwan. And recently we launched our Fukuoka Startup Collective uh, based in Fukuoka, Japan, and grow exponentially in the last uh, amount. So we are over 100 members now, and we are very active on and LinkedIn group and also on Slack. So I um, support uh, international founders as well, because I'm a founder. I know the problem, the pros and cons in Japan. And since April, Last year, I've been senior advisor for NIPA, the Korean government uh, institute, national institute, helping founders to expand their businesses and footprint in Japan. That's awesome. It, me. We'll pick your brains about Japan later on as well. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you can talk, Sophia, but because uh, you don't seem to be connected to the audio, but if you can write a few words on the chat. Oh, you can. Okay, hi. Yeah, no, no, I, I just had it turned off just because in case there's background noise. Um, hi, I'm Sophia. I'm currently based in Seoul. 
Um, and then I'm running an education consulting company right now, but we're also looking to go into ed tech, which is why I joined the conversation today. Okay, nice to meet you. Uh, next is Neetish, I think. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Nitish, and currently we are running company Medhnath, that is AI company. Uh, and uh, and here in Korea, we are trying to expand uh, with CG Olive and other few companies. So this is why we are going to set up a branch here in South Korea. Anyway, I'm staying here in Korea for almost five years, and looking forward to expand our business here. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And last but not least, Francisca, if you could say a few words about yourself and your company. Yes, hello. Good morning or good afternoon. It depends on where you are. So my well, name good is... Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm a business development manager and working for a company called PL Bioscience. And we are producing... Yeah, it's a cell culture supplement. So it's a um, supplement that is used for growing cells in all kinds of conditions. And uh, we are um, yeah, pretty interested in going into the Korean market. Um, my boss is also from South Korea. So yeah, it's a very interesting market in the cell therapy and regenerative medicine uh, point of view. So um, yeah, I'm really interested in meeting you and uh, also companies and uh, yeah I'm looking forward to the program awesome that's great to meet you uh, I've heard a lot about you so um, hello everybody welcome to the Korea K basics uh, workshop as the name suggests we'll be going over some very uh, basic but fundamental stuff when it comes to the Korean startup ecosystem and setting up business in Korea there will be a continuation of this workshop later on where there will be more deep dives into specific topics and details, uh, but we will definitely inform you once the details of that are confirmed. In the meantime, today, like Jay mentioned, I will be talking about the Korean startup ecosystem. Jay will talk about uh, visas and more uh, administrative stuff on how to make yourself stay in Korea. We also will have... Uh, a lawyer from one of the famous uh, law groups here called Delight, who will talk about the um, legal issues of setting up business in Korea, depending on what sort of business you're doing. And last but not least, we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session to uh, address more specific questions that you may have. Um, there'll be brief Q&A sessions between each presentation. So don't worry that you do don't have to hold until the end with your questions. If you cannot hold on and you have to ask the question like right away, rather than stop the presenter, I suggest you use the chat uh, to drop your uh, question and then we will circle back to you with, with the answer. So are we ready to rock and roll? Okay, well, no, I, I won't be dancing or singing if, if that's what you were worried about. But um, who knows, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't. We'll see about that. So, um, Hold on. Let me let me present my screen. Did you do you see my screen? First and foremost. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll skip the ice breaking because we already did that. Um, just a few details about myself, very briefly. I already mentioned I work for South Venture, Self Startup, Start to Group. Um. I went, I've been living in Korea. Obviously, as you can see, I'm not Korean. Unlike uh, Jay and Jion, I am anything but Korean. However, I've been living in Korea altogether for over 20 years. I finished a uh, local university. I worked for Samsung Electronics for a couple of years. I worked also as a bartender before swinging to the startup scene. I ran K Startup Grand Challenge, which I'll talk about later. It's one of the government support programs specifically for foreign entrepreneurs. I worked for a German startup that entered the Korean startup scene. And uh, ever since then, I've been also building the ecosystem and communities for startuppers and for developers in Korea. So this is me, and this is what I bring you today. I want to talk about the startup ecosystem, but before we dive into Korean startup ecosystem, 
let's start with the very basics and let's ask ourselves the very fundamental question of what is an ecosystem? What is a startup ecosystem? Uh, before, well, my, my mistake, before I do that, take away the startup word and think about what is an ecosystem for you? If you if you have a question, an answer, feel free to share it in the, the chat room, or you can raise your hand and and say say it here. What is an ecosystem? Or what do you think? Uh, what comes to your mind when you think ecosystem? Very shy group. Okay, hi Sophia. Hi, um, maybe I'll give it a go. Um, so an ecosystem, just regardless of whether it's a startup ecosystem or a bio ecosystem, I guess it consists of the players in a particular mm -hmm. relationship. So I guess the key words would be the fact that there are many players and then that they're each going to have certain relationships with each other and there's probably going to be a hierarchy in it as well. And mm -hmm. so that, that all of it together ends up being a kind of circular model. So I, I think, I don't know, maybe it's just like a big word just to describe the relationships between a, a very vast group of people. Right, I agree. Think about it. Well, we talk about the environment ecosystem, right? So it's a con connection, relationships, like you mentioned, between uh, animals, plants, uh, whatever living organisms that you have uh, living in a certain space. And, uh, and how they interact. So all the components, uh, all the flows between those components. So, you know, in an ecosystem, obviously a bigger animals eats a smaller animal, which eats an even smaller animal, et cetera, et cetera. And they give each other energy. All those flows and cycles and interactions are described by the ecosystem. And you might think, ooh, yeah, eating other animals grows. But to be honest, th this same concept pretty much applies to the startup ecosystem as well. This is how the Korean government sees the uh, startup ecosystem. It's not very circular. It's very linear. They pretty much want an entrepreneur to become a company via different uh, components, different resources, different infrastructure uh, parts, and uh, government policies. They see it more as a performance uh, graph rather than a circular model like Sophia mentioned. This is how I see the uh, startup ecosystem. For me, in a perfectly healthy startup ecosystem, the startups are in the middle. Every other player, be it the government, be it accelerators or VCs, communities, uh, corporations, um, educational institutions, they are there to support the growth of entrepreneurs, the growth of entrepreneurs and their development to become um, eventually maybe unicorns, but not necessarily unicorns, just successful, successful companies. Um, so um, to each their own, obviously, uh, the government and I don't see eye to eye, but uh, this is how I see that the ecosystem the startup ecosystem looks like. So startup ecosystems get rated a lot. You can hear about it a lot on the news and uh, especially the Korean uh, news gets really excited when uh, news outlets like Startup Genem or Bloomberg or other uh, agencies rate the startup ecosystems. And they're usually rated on several factors. So first and foremost is the infrastructure. Like, are, are, are is there an infrastructure for entrepreneurship to develop? Next is the legal system. How easy is the legal uh, aspect of setting up a business in a given country, in a given city? Uh, how well is that ecosystem promoted globally around the world, but also locally among its citizens? Are people aware that, the, that, for instance, Seoul is a great startup ecosystem? Are there efforts made to create connections and network between various ecosystem players and not only within the ecosystem itself, but beyond the ecosystem? 
how accessible is it? How engaged is it? And how transparent is it to not only people inside, but also people on the outside who are interested getting on the inside? Uh, are there success cases and are there role models that young entrepreneurs and wannabe entrepreneurs can look up to? And for me personally, the most important thing is, is there a community and is there a give first mindset? Give first mindset is pretty much uh, the, 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 mind, the mindset of giving to the community first, like offering your knowledge, offering your resources, offering your network to the community of entrepreneurs, because that act of giving will come back to you tenfold. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it eventually will come back to you uh, as a great asset. And it's very important that the, the that uh, you understand that the successful ecosystems like Silicon Valley, Boulder, Colorado, um, Berlin, they are very focused on that give first approach to entrepreneurship. So that brings me to Korea. So what is the Korean startup ecosystem? This we could write a whole book about, and indeed people have written books about it but I'll try to make it short and sweet for you all so that uh, you can enjoy yourself and also learn something new if you haven't heard about it before. Before I talk about the ecosystem itself, I have to emphasize that it all goes down to the history or the modern history of Korea. You must understand that after World War II, after the Korean War, Korea, and when I say Korea, I'm talking about South Korea today. We're not talking about North Korea. That's another whole other story altogether and a whole other lecture. But so South Korea or Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, like extremely, extremely poor, totally devastated by wars, totally devastated by previous Japanese colonial occupation, a country struggling, struggling to survive. And that forced people to be more more in the, in the survival mode to get through, to survive, but also to be very entrepreneurial when it comes to finding those new survival tactics and putting food on the table and helping their families get by. So now a pop quiz for everyone. Um, do you recognize uh, these are these are these represent three very famous companies that I bet you a hundred bucks you know actually I'm not gonna bet, bet you a hundred bucks but metaphorical a hundred bucks you know these companies can you guess what, what they are if you do unmute yourself and feel free to speak up they're very famous They're like, Nongshim. <laughs> no, Nongshim is not here. Sorry, but oh. close enough. Hyundai. Hyundai is here. Yes, Hyundai is here. Hyundai is the bottom one. We have two more, the two black ones. One has its name drawn on it. Literally drawn. LG. <laughs> L yes, LG is here. LG used to be, funny story, LG used to be, a, well, still is, they have a still chemical uh, part of their uh, business, but they used to make cosmetics. Well, again, they still do, but that was their main and one of the first businesses they, they did. And they originally were called Lucky Gold Star. So if you're as old as I am, you may have had uh, not an LG TV when you were a kid, but a Lucky Gold Star TV back in the days. So what's the last one? The three stars. What company can have three stars? Oh, Samsung. Yes, Samsung. Congratulations. So Samsung in Chinese characters or like in Hanja, because a lot of Korean words come from the Chinese characters, means three stars. So the why am I talking about these companies? Well, they are, you can say, the precursors kind of of the uh, new wave of entrepreneurship and new wave of business in Korea. A lot of them started in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, 
a lot of them, uh, like Samsung was a trading company, a textile trading company. They were, and Hyundai were uh, rice dispensaries. And uh, they started because uh, people were very entrepreneurial and wanted to do something in their uh, vincity and uh, change the world. But what is very important is that uh, as time went by and as Korea uh, was picking itself up from the destructions of both the Second World War II and the Korean War of the 50s, it, uh, it became very focused on rebuilding its industry, rebuilding its infrastructure, and rebuilding its position in the world, or more to put it up, grant, granting itself a position in the world. Very important thing that you must know about uh, South Korea is that after the wars, it was not a democratic country. In fact, it didn't become a democratic country until the 1990s. It was, in fact, a military dictatorship, and a military dictatorship that also had a central um, economic planning committee, which pretty much designed the whole economy and the economic growth for the next decades for Korea. And what they did is they went to small little companies, or well, they weren't that small, but they were, say, medium-sized companies like Samsung, Dell, Hyundai, LG, and were like, okay, you, you guys, from now on, you're going to go in shipbuilding, you'll get... Uh, tax grants from us, whatever, whatever help you need, but you're going to be in shipbuilding. You guys, automotive, you guys, semiconductors, you chemical, we're going to close the market for any imports of those products. So you will definitely become number one in your, in Korea with that product. And we want you to do whatever it takes. And we mean whatever to become number one in the world in this category. And if you do become number one in this category, we're going to give you even more incentives. So inspired by this, or more like forced by this, those corporates, later to be corporates, really put on a, a huge effort to uh, become leading uh, companies in their respective um, industries. And so because of that huge nationwide effort, uh, not only did the companies themselves uh, get involved, but also the individual citizens like put on their lives on the stake. If you ask your Korean friends, they'll tell you that their grandparents, even their parents, they worked their life out of themselves to for those companies so these companies could succeed and become number one in their respective industries. And so because of that um, all around nationwide effort, with from 1950s to the 1920s, Korea became from one of the poorest countries in the world, one of the richest countries in the world, coming into top ten of when it, top ten economies in the world. As well as the that the industry developed, starting from very simple uh, textile shoe uh, exports, going through <clears throat> heavy industries like shipbuilding and automotive. And, uh, and to uh, later on in the 2010s to computers, mobile phones, semiconductors. And what is next for Korea? Well, that's why Korean government is so focused on the, those startups because they're looking for the next big thing, the next big industry that Korea is gonna shine at. And what will it be? Well, we'll see in the next few slides. Before the next few slides happen, here's Korea in a few numbers. Population of almost uh, 52 million with the lowest birth rate in the world and a very rapidly decreasing uh, population. Uh, the, one of the biggest economies in the world, number one when it comes to innovation, according to Bloomberg, and a highly, highly skilled and educated workforce. Over 70% of the population are college graduates uh, and almost 100 are high school graduates. So. You have very well-educated, very talented people. Um, yeah, what's there, what's there to ask? <laughs> and so Korea has been uh, developing in various industries from zero to hero and uh, putting a lot of emphasis also on this new thing called startups. Before I talk about startups, there's one very important aspect you, you should remember about Korea. 
Korea really likes Korea. So when you come to Korea, Google Maps won't work. I recommend using Naver Maps or uh, Kakao Maps. Uh, your Korean friends won't use WhatsApp or Messengers. They'll prefer to use Kakao Talk. And most likely they'll use uh, an Android phone rather than an Apple phone, although that is changing uh, currently. So how did the startups come to be? Um, if you know a little bit about the Asian history, you may recall that around 1997, there was something called the IMF crisis, which pretty much crushed several Asian economies, including uh, Korea. It was to do with overspending, over loaning, uh, over de debit <laughs> of conglomerates, and that resulted in a crush of the economy. A lot of people going jobless, real struggle, um, comparable maybe to the struggle we have today, but even worse because it came as a crush, an overnight crush pretty much. And the government realized that uh, up until now, it had relied on only a handful of corporates like Samsung, LG, Hyundai, uh, and so on, to support the GDP, to support the economy, and that in order to be sustainable, they had to shift their way of thinking and also think about smaller companies, smaller innovative companies. The, that new thing they've been hearing about from the US, let's look at it a little bit more. To, before they were called startups, they were called venture companies. And so the government from the late 1990s started to look closely at them, started supporting them more and more actively. And uh, as time went by, a lot of these uh, companies or a couple of these companies became corporates themselves, which I'll mention in the next slides. So all the growth uh, of startups in uh, in Korea resulted with uh, over 25 of 25 unicorns that you can find on the web page here don't worry we'll be sending the slides to you so uh you'll have a chance to 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 click it and see if there's a description of each company here but before i um uh, i move on i wanted to ask you do you recognize any of the brands here which ones do you recognize and those who are korean are not allowed to answer i know you recognize them that's that's cheating <laughs> As a non-Korean person, sorry, I came a little bit later. No worries. <laughs> Actually, yeah, Yanolja, Sokar, Curly, uh, and Dunamo, I guess. Oh, and Tridge. Yeah, oh, that's those. great. Oh, yeah. Jipan. Jipan also. They, they're, they're booking like the they're, they're house renting stuff. Those yes. that all I know. Yeah. Okay, that's that. That's quite quite a lot. You know quite a lot. How, can I ask how you know about them? I mean, um, well, like someone whom I knew, like were, were used to work at Sokar and uh, Jikban. I was using it like when I was trying to find myself a house. <laughs> yeah, Yanalja, just just like know the brand. Yeah. Oh, Muzinsa also. That's a huge clothing retailer. Yeah. Yes, it's my 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 guilty pleasure as well. Where, where, oh yeah. Where, where most of my money goes. <laughs> Exactly. Wow. Awesome. So, uh, thank you, Sophia. You know quite a lot of them. Uh, and for the rest of you who don't know them, don't worry. Uh, like I said, we'll send out the slides with descriptions of all the startups. Um, yeah, they're they're quite efficient. The, the The unique thing about the Korean startups, however, is that they're number one, but they're number one on the Korean market. So, in a lot of cases, you uh, unless you're uh, actively interested in Korea, like yourselves you wouldn't know about these companies. And only uh, and, uh, since a few years ago have some of them very shyly started expanding globally. So Sokar is tapping into the Southeast Asian market. Uh, Tangan Carrot is going into the UK. Onnerit Sheep, also known as Bucket Place, is tapping into the, the US. So they're very shyly, shyly trying to, to go abroad. But uh, the thing is, when they were started and when they were developed, they were developed with the thought that they will be number one in Korea and Korea only. And that's a very unique characteristic of Korean startups that has been changing in the last few years. So if they're startups, where do they get the money uh, other than the government? They also get the money from the VCs. So as time went by, uh, the number of VCs and the number of investments they put into the startups have grown. There's over a thousand VCs 
currently re registered in Korea at the moment. And uh, yes, they're more and more active, more and more um, involved in the Korean startup scene. Uh, however, you have to remember that in a lot of cases, um, about 50% of the funds that the VCs invest into startups actually come from government grants. So there are government grants. There's a meta fund that uh, is run by the government and it is disposed to the VCs to invest farther on into the startup. So they're at the end of the day, they're investing with our tax money. <laughs> so you're welcome. But um, um, yeah, but uh, but that has, has also been changing. So I say 50%, but back in the days, that number was 70%. So uh, VCs are more and more um, risk taking the, the way they should be as VCs, more uh, involved in, in the startup's growth process, and more, um, more uh, encouraging towards early stage startups than they used to be. Back in the days when I entered the startup scene, Korean VCs would only invest in later stage startups or startups that they knew would become later stage startups. They would re bluntly refuse to invest into early stage startups. Now that has been changing, thankfully. However, <laughs> sorry, I'm hold on a second. I have to have a drink, please. I am having a little bit of a cold, so bear with me. So um, as everywhere in the world, um, the last few year and a half, has not been um, um, shining flowers and rainbows and unicorns, uh, mostly to do with the, with the economic crisis, uh, stagnation of the economy, inflation, and that has reduced drastically the number of investments. However, the last uh, quarter has been quite promising. I don't have the numbers for that, but it has been quite promising, offering hope that the uh, freeze in the investments is over and uh, the uh, VCs will once again pick up where they left off. Where do the VCs invest in? Well, according to the latest data from the Startup Alliance, one of their favorite places when it comes to the number of investments, not the amount of investments, is healthcare, <laughs> finance and insurance, content and social media uh, related stuff. But also uh, one of the hot topics, according to the government, is definitely AI, uh, definitely um, generative AI, and uh, also if anything involving green and environment at the moment is very interesting for the uh, Korean government. So there is a big, when you look at the breakdown of the Korean startups, a lot of them are software uh, development related startups, a lot of AI, a lot of ICT, IoT, <clears throat> cloud uh, technology, and various communication and security uh, uh, solutions. There's also digital healthcare, fintech and blockchain, uh, mobile internet, and so on and so on. Uh, so there is a strong trend for ICT and deep tech related stuff. The ecosystem is, uh, like I said, very government driven. Actually, this slide should go a little bit later, but never mind. I'll talk about it later. And so uh, a few years ago, the government set up a series of um, creative economy cent centers for creative economy and innovation around Korea. You can see there are major cities and provinces around the country and each center is partnered with a corporation. So they're funded both by government money and corporate money. And so the, because of that, they each specialize in specific industry. So for instance, the one in Seoul is uh, with city, to do with city life and they're partnered with CJ. The one in Pusan is partnered with Lotte and they do uh, logistics and uh, film. Retail and logistics, sorry. Um, the one in Tejon is ICT and they're partnered with SK. Um, the one in Tegu is, uh, surprise, surprise, the, the, the birthplace of Samsung. It's partnered with Samsung and is with uh, electronics and uh, oil related stuff. So, uh, yeah, so it's so these centers are to kind of the role is to 
develop local startup ecosystems because when you look at Korea, everything is pretty much focused around Seoul and Gyeonggi area. And now we want to take that a little bit away from, from that center and also have other ecosystems develop as well. So how do startup founders in Korea rate their ecosystem? Well, surprise, surprise, or maybe not such a surprise. In the last year, they have uh, the, the grade they give to the startup ecosystem has decreased quite sufficiently mostly to do with the, the, the decrease in investments and the general uh, economic slowdown. Life is not easy for startup founders. Uh, they um, see mostly negative uh, changes and have pretty negative outlook, mostly to do with the economic crisis <laughs> and no, um, no any um, potential support from um, the private sector. Despite of the quite uh, active uh, role of the government, startups are still worried that uh, because the VCs are not investing and the businesses are not big businesses are not so eager to do business with them, that they, their chances of survival are quite diminishing. The government. So uh, the for the government for the startups uh, that uh, they think that the most important for them for their business, um, operations is financial support, but also they need see that they need the regulation and system improvements in order to be more and more efficient. And so that, that's why the role of the government is so crucial for the startup founders. When it comes to financial support, one of the most famous programs run by the Korean government is called TIPS. <coughs> it's called, I forgot the um technology uh, something program for startups. Anyway, it, long story short, it's to fund R&D for startups. And what happens is you're partnered with a VC slash accelerator, which invests into your R&D and the government uh, matches that uh, investment with a grant uh, for uh, mostly for R&D, but also for marketing and other expenses that your company may incur. The government also does a lot of effort when it comes to offering space and infrastructure for startups. There's a lot of programs offering free office space for entrepreneurs of all shapes and sizes. Um, there's great uh, efforts also made to connect the academia R&D uh, with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurs and also to initiate funding uh, uh, through, in, uh, through direct investment into startups. Um, so uh, there is, like I said, the role of the Korean government, very, very important. Um, so like I mentioned, economic investment for the startups has been going down. Um, so what, what, what is, um, what do the startups think that should be done? So according to them, we need to develop, uh, they need to, as startups, develop uh, more be, uh, so self-sufficient and develop a way of earning revenue rather than uh, supporting themselves only on investments, only on government grants. Uh, look for more profitability and uh, implement various cost-saving strategies that will make the company survive. Uh, the, some mention also uh, pursuing government incentives, but that also means that because of that, the competition for government support programs is bigger and more fierce than ever before. Uh, another interesting thing about the, the startups in Korea is where do they want to expand? So it shouldn't be surprising that they want to hear hit near home. Uh, Southeast Asia is the first one on the roster, followed by North America, mostly because uh, there's a big diaspora, uh, Korean diaspora in North America, but also I think for most uh, startup ecosystems, uh, the US, Silicon Valley is the that cherry on the top, that pinnacle that you want to achieve uh, if you want to succeed as a, as a company. Next is ne next door Japan, followed by Europe and China which has uh, decreased its uh, position when it comes to the, the choice. 
<laughs> of market for Korean startups. <clears throat> so I talked about the Korean government, but Korean government is huge. Like the Ministry of SMEs and Startups itself is a vast monster with a lot of institutions under it. So to tell a very long story short, most governments, uh, most startup supporting institutions, government institutions are either under the Ministry of SMEs and Startups or under the Ministry of ICT and Technology. Uh, so either or you'll be looking at, and uh, they offer various uh, support. Obviously, the uh, the ones under Ministry of ICT and Technology were, will be more, more focused on the R&D side. The ones under Ministry of SMEs and Startups will be more focused on commercialization and business development. The number one institution and the one that we also represent here is the Korea Institute of Startup and Entrepreneurship Development. It runs the most amount of programs for uh, uh, entrepreneurs, especially for foreign entrepreneurs. They're closely followed uh, by uh, SBA, Seoul Business Agency, that's under the Seoul government. Uh, they put a lot of effort into building a, a startup ecosystem with several centers around the city and a lot of initiatives, both uh, globally. They used to run Seoul Global Startup Center. That is not run by them anymore. It's going to be reopened this year under said. Next is the Creative Economies uh, and Innovation Centers that I mentioned. There's several, uh, I think, 17 of them around the country. And <clears throat> they do a lot, especially in their local uh, ecosystems to build uh, relationships between corporations and startups, offer POCs, offer pilots with those corporations, but also bridge uh, gaps between their, uh, the regional ecosystems and the ones in uh, Seoul and Gyeonggi-do area. Um, another uh, notable mention is definitely NIPA, National IT Industry Promotion Agency, which until recently had been running a, career, a case startup grant challenge. Um, they are will be running another program this year, so stay tuned for that. Uh, so uh, government, government, but how about the corporates? So yes, the corporates are more and more in, involved when it comes to the startup ecosystem in, uh, in Korea. Originally, they were very suspicious of it and to be honest, not very nice to startups. And I say that as someone who worked in Samsung, we used to uh, kind of take advantage of uh, startups, steal their technology or pay, underpay them, um, usually acquire them and to take their company apart and just use their technology to our advantage. That's not happening anymore or it's not happening as prominently as it used to be. We've uh, cut down a little bit on that. Uh, but definitely when it comes to supporting the startup ecosystem, the number one uh, are companies that started as startups themselves. So Naver and Kakao uh, that you may know, uh, Naver search engine, Kakao, multiple things, but definitely Kakao talk the communication app. They're followed by Samsung, Hyundai, Lotte, SK, and GS and others as well when it comes to support. Most of them, most of these or all of these companies run uh, open open innovation programs, CVC programs. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely please keep your tabs on them or join Seoul Startups where I'll be uh, posting any information that I have about these programs. So uh, the government support programs. Every year, every first Monday of the year, the Korean government publishes a list of government support programs. It's over a hundred pages. I actually took my time to translate this over the weekend. Uh, I'll send you the link later. Um, and yeah, you can uh, look at the, the, the various programs, uh, how much the budget is. You can also find them on the website called kstartup.go.kr, <clears throat> which I do suggest that you look at because uh, even if the program is from last year, it's very likely that it'll happen this year and you can see what the requirements were for the previous year. Also, there's usually a contact number to the person responsible for a given program and you can give them a call and find out when uh, more details will be announced about the new application process. <clears throat> so how about the programs for foreigners? Because 
uh, up until recently, the Korean government has been very bullish on putting the Korean startups out globally on the outbound programs. But this year, there's a lot of effort done on the inbound program. So back in the game is our good old friend, the K-Startup Grand Challenge, this time run by Kisset. It will be for uh, 40 startups, overseas startups, a three, three and a half month program uh, on the, where you will be helped in setting up a business here in Korea. The applications start in April. Um, they have their website, so definitely check it out for more details. Uh, next program is the one that we're actually a pilot for called K-Scouter. It's a more, um, how do I put it? A more tailored program, more for more mature companies uh, that are more focused on being the serious about establishing great connections and great business partners here in Korea. The official part, the, so the unofficial part of the program is already going on. The official part of the program will be announced in February. Last but not least, uh, actually, there's one more, but the, the Oasis program, but Jay is going to talk about it, so I'm not going to steal her thunder. Last but not least is the Global Startup Center. Like I said, there used to be a sole Global Startup Center. It closed a couple of years ago. It's coming back this year. Um, I hear the, the little birds have been telling me that it will be in Gangnam, in Yoksam area, and it will be specifically for uh, foreign entrepreneurs, for foreign startups, supporting everything from visas, consulting, uh, getting talent, networking, community building. You you ask it, you name it, they got it. And uh, they are supposed to open in June. So we'll probably be hearing about them soon. Here are some lessons and highlights that I gained uh, from the Korean market over the years that I would like to share with you before I wrap up my presentation. A lot of things that happen on the Korean startup ecosystem or the Korean market are, are dictated by the government. The government pretty much tells what the flavor of the month when it comes to technology and startup development is. We may like it, we may not like it, but it is what it is. Uh, going global starts local, and that means if co Korean startups want to become global, want to succeed on the global eco startup scene, they have to be ready to embrace foreign startups in Korea and also embrace them into their ecosystem. Help Korean startup ecosystem first become global before it starts sending startups abroad. There is something like a generational clash in Korea and not only socially, but also when it comes to startups. There's at least three different generations of startup founders, and uh, so they differ when it comes to their approach to doing business, to building relationships, but also to being part of the community. Thankfully, the younger generation, the 20s, early 30s, um, are very open-minded, are very pro-community, uh, are all about giving back and giving first, and that makes me very hopeful for the future. And there is a rising social awareness when it comes to social impact ventures. The government has also noticed it. And there's some interesting initiatives going on in that sector as well. So to wrap up my uh, part of the presentation is Korea is not an easy market for young entrepreneurs. It's not an easy market for foreigners. But if you play your cards right, if you do your homework, you really have a chance of setting a foothold in a very dynamic market that can open doors to other Asian markets and to other global markets as well. So yeah, that's all from me. Um, but I would love to hear your questions. Um, so feel free to ask me, ask me anything. Well, almost anything. So, nope. Marta, you said that starting this year, the Korean government is more open towards foreign companies. Does that mean this year's programs should have uh, more access to funds for foreign companies versus what we've seen in the past? Yes. So so the Korean government got very excited when uh, one foreign company, one foreign led company got the TIPS funding and they want to see more foreign companies succeed in getting the uh, fund, fund access and uh, 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 support, government support that was up to now mostly only uh, accessible to 
uh, Korean founders. And so it's not only about running new programs um, or running more programs, but also uh, about opening um, and being more transparent and more open when for foreign interpreters so that kstartup.go.kr website that I told you about, there's supposed to be a English version of it launched very soon that will have also access to all the programs so that you will have all the information in English uh, and you can apply in English as well for most of the programs. Great, thank you. Um, but don't maybe ask this me question... about the timeline because I have no idea when that's gonna happen. Probably not till later, but um, so for some of these industries, you know, you know, you talk about and you showed earlier in the slide some of the areas that focused in. Uh, the area that I'm focused in is a little bit smaller, but it's still a fairly sizable chunk in terms of, let's say, agricultural agricultural goods and things like that. Um, how would we work with the government to, to deal with issues like tariffs and things like that? Because that's one of the big barriers that, that I'm particularly facing. Uh, how do we lobby or how do we get uh, government to, let's say, uh, give uh, exceptions or or something for along those lines? Yeah, so so for for, for, for for particularly for the agricultural, so the the problem with agriculture related stuff is that the government, and it's not only the Korean government, is very pro protective and very close to anything from the outside. Um, it is what it is, it, especially in Korea where the agriculture is such a small small chunk, but it's also very traditional, and uh, they're very inclined to protect it. But that being said. Uh, there are agencies that are interested in innovating the the, the 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 agriculture market as well, and so under the Ministry of Agriculture, there's a Korea Agriculture Technology Promotion Agency. Uh, I'll 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 send you the the link to them later, but okay. uh, they 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 specifically focus on startups in that uh, area, and they also help them with overcoming various barriers and tariffs. Uh, that can come across uh, their businesses. Yeah, because yeah, I know the Korean government's very protective on things, agricultural goods, particularly domestic goods, for example, like, you know, the area that I'm working with in terms of uh, of honey. But at the same time, what what Australia and New Zealand have to offer is not something that's possible in the Korean market as well, yet yeah, we still course. face the same uh, tariff challenges. So, Yeah, so, so the best way is to kind of find, have that sort of agency on your side and kind of prove to them the benefits of having that product on the Korean market and how the Korean business and agriculture can benefit from having that market, that product right. in Korea. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? If not, uh, in that case, so I will share the slides with you later. So don't worry, they'll, they'll, they'll be coming to you. Uh, in that case, uh, I would like to ask uh, Jay to take over uh, and, um, yeah, and tell us everything she has to tell us about the Oasis visa. Okay, so before I jump into Oasis visa, first, uh, let's invite the uh, Hyunji Jang. She's a lawyer from the Delight, so she's uh, here with us, and then she can talk about the uh, the Korea, you know, the law system, etc. Hyunji, are you there? Um, hi. Hi. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So we, Hyunji, you can start whenever you are ready. And then the Jihyun, can you give her access? She can uh share her uh the presentation. Or I think you have the um. Oh. Oh. Sorry. You should be able to to share the screen. Hi, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. You see it in small size or um, in full? 
BC as a smaller size. Why don't you uh, press that, yes, that button and then maybe they will make it bigger. Okay. I think this should be fine. Uh, Henry, don't worry, just you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. So, um, hi, um, my name is Hyunji. I am an attorney at law at Delight Law Group in South Korea. Um, it's located in Gangnam, Seoul. And so if you're planning to come for a global startup center, which Marta has just introduced, um, you can drop by uh, our office as well. And um, I am a lawyer who specializes in intellectual property law and um, corporate laws. Uh, do you see the next page? Okay. Um, so um, we have many startup clients um, in Korea. And since we have um, branches in um, Canada, Germany, and other Southeast Asian countries, um, we often work with foreign companies who wish to work in Korea and who wish to enter Korean market. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, Labor Standards Act in Korea and must knows for foreign entrepreneurs in Korea. I know that um, most of you may not be very interested in labor laws and actually me neither. <laughs> As I said, I specialize in IP laws and corporate laws, but um, in most cases, um, we just could, I mean, the startups come to us and say they just want to uh, get legal advices for, the, their own business related issues, for example, like, you know, stock options and like share purchase agreement, share subscription agreement, et cetera. But um, in fact, in many cases, they face some labor related issues in terms um, of um, their ignorance and misunderstanding in Korean laws. So I just thought that it's important that we um, have this very basic knowledge in labor law in Korea which is Labor Standards Act. And um, in fact, um, there is a job in Korea called Domusa. It's called labor attorney, but they're not actually an attorney, but more of a consultant uh, regarding, um, uh, I mean, on labor issues. But um, they are actually practically more, uh, they have mo more practical knowledges on labor issues. so. Um, in many sense, uh, in, in many cases, we also get advices from them as well, but they are just simply not attorneys who can go to lawsuits or something. So um, we're quite different, but I am not a labor lawyer and I'm not a labor attorney, but still um, I have, but working with many startups and foreign companies, I just thought that it's so important that uh, the startup companies and foreign companies know the very basics of Labor Standards Act so that they do not violate the laws. And I personally felt that it's really necessary um, to have a, this very basic understanding on this. So what we'll um, cover today are the things that you should know when first, when you make an employment agreement with um, the employee with an employee. And second, when you fire an employee. Um, and today I will and I will not cover the labor union thing or you know minimum wages, work time limit, or you know, like workplace harassment and workplace um, discrimination, etc. Because you know everybody knows that workplace harassment is wrong and not a rightful thing to do. So we'll basically focus on these two things because there are um, many crucial issues related to this um, two uh, issues. So why Labor Standards Act? I mean, like, why do we have to have this understanding on the Labor Standards Act in Korea? First, employment protection in South Korea is relatively strict. You know, um, I know that um, in most cases, people think that Korea is more of corporate friendly um, environment for um, the company, I mean, corporate friendly environment. But in some sense, especially in terms of employment protection, uh, we have really strict laws in South Korea, and it's in some sense very employee friendly. And second, um, failure to comply with these labor laws can result in criminal penalties. I mean, it's not just the monetary penalties, but you can even go to jail if you do not comply with this labor law. 
And third, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, you know, prevention is always the best. And I just feel so bad that there are so many businesses and companies that face this sort of same labor issues because of their this ignorance and misunderstanding of this very simple and very easy to understand regulations in Korea. And, you know, when um, an employer comes to us talking about their problems and issues uh, regarding their employees, it is often um, already too late. I mean, for example, like you already fired this employee in an illegal manner and the employee uh, reported your violation of law to the labor office in Korea, then, you know, it takes costs and time, you know, including attorney costs, uh, to make the settlements and compensations. So it's best to make the prevention. So basically the scope of application is that this act applied to all businesses or workplaces in which not less than five people, uh, five, five employees are regularly employed. So here, employee means a person who offers labor to um, the business or workplace for purpose of earning wages. And um, however, it does not really mean that uh, this act, this labor act in whole does not apply to the business with four or less employees. Still, you should note that some articles still apply to that company as well, but this is just giving a very general criterion um, that you should make sure that you should um, comply with this act if you are running a business with more than five employees. And employees um, here include all not only full-time workers, but it also include temporary, part-time, and foreign workers, um, but not employers, freelancers, or contractors, etc. Um, and for the, the freelancers, um, but you should note that um, in some senses, I mean, in some cases, freelancers may also be subject to this act uh, based on substantive criteria. So for example, uh, there are various different criteria given by the court, but like first it would be, you know, if the employee, I mean, if, if the, that freelancer is under direct supervision or direct control of the employer. And second, if the payment is made regardless of achievement that were made by the freelancer or, you know, that are more of fixed, you know, monthly based payment are made. And third, if there is this fixed time and place of work required for that work. And fourth, um, if there is this sort of exclusivity of employment um, when that um, freelancer is making with the company is more of this like exclusive, exclusive basis. So in some sense, while you're making a freelancer contract, you have to be aware that this, uh, um, they can be construed as an employee, not, a, the, not the freelancer in some cases. And the scope of application um, that in principle, any contracts that are um, against this act shall be null and void. I mean, and it means that the shall be, no, uh, shall be null and void to that extent. It means that um, any articles within the, um, any articles in the employment contract that is against this act shall have no effect but the other articles can uh, still have effect. And this means that um, in Korea, Labor Standards Act prevail over freedom of contract. So anything that is against the Labor Standards Act, um, although you have freedom of contract, still Labor Standards Act prevail. So you have to follow this act. And anything that does not, does, that, does, that may violate this law um, has no effect for the employee. So um, let me start with this employment contract, uh, making an employment contract. So you have to make clear statements of terms and conditions of employment when you make an employment contract. This is a legal duty. And what it means by a clear statement of terms and conditions is that you have to um, include wages, the working hours and holidays 
annual paid leaves, and um, other terms and conditions of employment prescribed by a presidential decree is like working place where you're working and the work scope, what you're doing, and uh, like work rules, if you have any. And when you make an employment contract, um, you know that in some countries, verbal contract also makes sense. And also verbal contract can uh, take effect. But in Korea, especially in terms of employment um, agreement, it should be a written statement. It should be a written contract. And the verbal contract does not make any effect. So. Here you say an employer shall deliver the written contract, including um, everything here written in Article 17, wages, contractor, working hours, holidays, and your paid leaves, etc. And And also, if you do not follow this law, that um, it should be a written statement. If you're not making the written contract, then you may be punished by a fine um, up to 5 million Korean won. And this is a kind of template uh, provided by Korean Labor Office. And so if you have any problem um, making or writing a contract, these are the uh, standard labor contract forms provided by Korean Labor Office. So this is for your reference. And they provide templates, including um, the contracts for full-time employees and part-time employees and for the underaged, you know, those people who are aged under 18 or even the foreigners. And this one, I, um, this one is for foreigner. Uh, this is a for, foreign uh, standard labor contract for foreigners. So you have Korean and English translation together. And well, I know this sounds so random that we've just talked about making an employment contract, and now we're talking about dismissal of employees. But um um. But please understand, because we have to, I have to fit this presentation within um, 30 minutes. So um, let me talk about dismissal of employees. And in many cases, um, dismissal of employees are the uh, are when most conflicts arise, because there would be hardly anyone who would be happy to be fired by a company. And of course, I cannot cover laws of all countries in the world, but uh, the United States is one of the most well-known countries with at-will employment principle. And at-will employment principle means that um, employer has the ability to dismiss an employee for any reason without having to establish just cause for termination and without warning as long as the reason is not illegal. And not illegal means that dismissal is not based on um, employee's gender, you know, sexual orientation, race, religion, et cetera. And what reminds me in terms of dismissal and what happened to me last week uh, while I was working was that there was this startup with an American entrepreneur who came to me and asked me to write her a standard form of an employment contract telling me that she would like to hire a part-time employee with an employment contract subject to termination at any time with advance notice. However, you know, as I will cover in later now on, I mean now on, such employment agreement is illegal and does not uh, have effect. And also, as you may remember, we had huge layoffs, in, you know, in last two years in IT industries, in, including Microsoft, Meta, you know, Twitter, etc. And I had a friend working in one of the global, you know, one of the biggest global IT companies, and she was working in a Korean office. And she was at that time on her maternity leave, but knew that there would be a huge layoff starting from the offices in the United States and Singapore, et cetera, because uh, she heard it from her colleagues and the whole newspaper was like talking about it. And she was actually told from the company that she is on the uh, layoff list. However, that does not make any sense in Korea, actually, since you cannot fire an employee who is on her maternity leave in Korea. 
So, you know, that was that company's mistake, not considering the Korean law. So later, my friend actually got a very, I mean, like quite good compensation on that from the company. So in Korea, you can't make an employment contract that can be terminated at any time. And you can't just make a massive layoff. So what I'm saying is that you can't just say, you know, you're fired and, you know, there's no need to come to the office from tomorrow. And because there are like employers duty based on this labor act. So what you should know that, what you should know is that um, in Korea, you should make at least 30 days in advance notice. And if you fail to give such a notice, you have to give the employee at least 30 days ordinary wage for that compensation. And there are only three exceptions um, that you may not need to uh, give this advance notice. First, if that employee has not worked more than three months. And second, in case of force majeure, like, you know, natural disaster or something, you know, and it should be something really crucial and critical. And third, where the employee has intentionally caused serious damages to the business or property loss. Also, you know, if um, the employee has made this huge damage to the com company, then you may not need to make this, you know, 30 day advance notice for the dismissal. And when you are making this notification of dismissal, you have to make it in written form with the grounds and timing of the dismissal. And that is only effective, the dismissal is only effective only upon a written notice. So what it means by grounds and timing is that, you know, you have to tell them why you're firing that person and what faults and damages were made by that employee. And also the timing, the exact date of dismissal, you know, which should be at least 30 days in advance. And in principle, also in Korea, employer can't, you know, just fire someone without justifiable cause. A justifiable cause is that there sh shall be some faults attributable to the employee. I mean, which means that you should have, you know, that employee should have um, intentionally caused some serious damages to the business or caused some huge, you know, property loss to the company. And may I intervene? Hi. Yeah. May I intervene in between? Uh, if mm -hmm. the company have some sort of fund shortage and they want to fire the employee, can it be the justifiable cause? Sorry, the company has what? Company has say shortage of fund, right? Oh, can they? They're running out of. You mean you mean like you know when they go bankrupt or something? Yes, maybe. Yes, so that's can... that's what I'm going to tell you in the next slide. <laughs> um. So, in terms of manager necessity, yes, you can fire employees, but it should be something very urgent. And in case of like, you know, transfer, mergers and acquisition of business, you can also fire employees in terms of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's to the some level, yes. For example, if company have certain funds, right? Mm -hmm. And they have certain number of employees and they wanna raise the fund, but for some reason they have not able to raise the fund, right? and mm -hmm. they have a plan to fire the employee, right? Can they do it? Um, can you give me more explanation on the funds? How yes. They... Mm -hmm. Yes. For example, if a company is running, right, and they have a runway of five months, right? That, okay, this is the, fu this is the fund, and this company will survive for five months because they have that sort of fund, right? They have not able to raise the fund for some reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Can the company uh, fire the employee? due to their personal issue because they have not able to raise the fund. I think have... I think I think um it's more um like case by cases and like it's like how much funds you're lacking and like it's if that fund is really not enough to employ um, I mean employ the um employee other person or something. You know, if you're really running out of um if you're really about to go bankrupt or something, then yes, you know it's possible because 
it should be it, it would be something of an urgent manager necessity. Okay, so I have another question. So into the contract document, right? When mm -hmm. employer makes a contract document with employee, they mm -hmm. have a say contract period of three years, right? Mm -hmm. And they decided to lay off, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it the breach of contract? Um yes, of course. So they cannot fire the employee uh in less than three months, right? Sorry, you three should, years. I right? mean, if if um the contract is, is like three year based, then yes. There show me it means that there was the agreement between the employer and the employee that they that that employee will be working in that company for three years, right? Yes. So, of course, it's a breach of contract. But um, which law will prevail? Because there's two part. Right? First is breach of contract, and the second part is that in Korea, if you have mm -hmm. less than five employee, right, you can fire yes. them, right? Yes. Uh, your law does not law is not applicable, right? So can mm -hmm. they breach the contract? Yes, I mean, it happens at the same time. So for example, if that employee is trying to claim for compensation, he can say first reason is um, for, um, on the basis um, of the breach of contract and also the violation of labor, labor law. But violation of labor law will not be applicable, right? Because they have no. less than five employees. No, I mean, the the... It can be a breach of compensation and breach of breach of contract. Uh, they can ask for you know monetary compensation to that company. But if you violate this um, labor act, you mm -hmm. can um, go to jail or you can. It's like it's just different. It's it's more of like crime, crime. Crime. You're you're committing a crime or you're compensating or something. It's just like two, two different fields. So into the contract, it should be clearly written, right? That uh, when the employee can terminate them, right? The, in such a way that it does not violate the contract. Sorry? So while making a contract uh, with the employee, right? It mm -hmm. should be clearly be written into the document, right? That, mm -hmm. okay, uh, of course, this contract is valid for three years, but in the mm -hmm. meantime, they can terminate, right? No, it's a breach of contract. If you're terminating the the three year contract be, before that three year passes, no. But what the point I was trying to make that into the contract, right? There, uh, to make this thing does not happen, right? What I'm trying to say is that, uh, we can just put one another clause into the contract that you know the employee employer can fire the employee under this this condition, right? Oh, you mean so, um. Let me clarify um, if I've understood correctly. So um, you say that you are making, so an employer is making a three-year employee um, employment contract with an employee. Yes. And you add a clause within that contract that uh, you can terminate at any time before three years. Uh, if uh, there is some emergency situation or something like that, right? For yeah. Then, then, uh, if they terminate, then it will not be a breach of contract, right? So they cannot claim for compensation. The employee cannot claim for compensation. Um, as I said, you know, any clauses that is against this act is void and null, so it has no effect. Yes, but uh. Uh, yeah, but as per labor law, you told, right, that for any reason, right, managerial reason, they can terminate the employee. Yeah, I mean, if that is considered um, by the court that that is urgent and manager necessity or that they terminate this contract, then it would be fine. But if not, if not, if it's not so, then, you know, it can be a, it can be a violation of the contract and can be the violation of this act as well. So in simple word, uh, it should be clearly be written that a uh, employee can be fired, right? When there is a, sorry, when uh, justifying the law of whatever the labor ministry, right? If they've... Hey, Nitesh, uh, your questions are very detailed. So how about you save them for uh, later for Q&A and also perfect, perfect, yeah. maybe ask Hyunju via email and let everyone else listen to the presentation, okay? Perfect, perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll...
Yes, I was talking about the justifiable cause. Justifiable cause, you know, would be, um, so for example, it'd be, um, it'd be more about like, you know, crime related things. So for example, if you receive money for, from a supplier and deliver defective products causing this disruption in the business, or, you know, in case of embezzlement, or if you steal some, you know, important resources in the business, or if you, um, share or if you um, give some confidential information of this company to you know other competitors or something you know then it can be justifiable cause to dismiss that employee so in short you know in korea in principle you know unless you commit a crime you know related to that business or give huge you know enormous damage to the company on purpose or, you know, for example, or the company is in huge crisis, just about to go bankrupt or something, you know, unless that that's the case, you know, the company really cannot fire you or they have to give, you know, huge compensation in order to fire you. And the restriction of dismissal is that, you know, you can't fire employees who are on sick leave for work injury or who are on maternity leave. Um, and here you say occupational injury or disease is more of like work injury. And courts in Korea um, have interpreted the term work-related injury quite broadly in Korea. So not just diseases or injuries, you know, that occur during or at work, but you know, in also cases like you know, when you're hit by a car while you're you were on the way to work, then, you know, this is also part of work-related injury. So in Korea, this occupational injury is um, interpreted quite broadly. So this is actually something um, more employee-friendly um, uh, interpretation in Korea. And um, this is something that I've mentioned just now. In case of urgent manager necessity, you can um, dismiss certain, I um, mean, you can dismiss some employees. Um, this is more of this like, you know, layoffs, which are like dismissals to reduce the number of employees, like huge dismissals. But this is, I mean, this article is more of layoffs, but um, I think for some cases um, where um, the company has, where the company of small, smaller scale has problems with manager, man, managerial um, issues, I think you can also use this article as the reasoning. And also, in some cases, um, you have to report to Minister of Employment and Labor in Korea for your layoff. Um, and such reports should be made at least 30 days in advance to the Minister of Labor, just like the, um, the report of dismissal. And um, this is more of the cases for big companies for with like more than 100 um, employees. So, and the next is payment. So you have to um, make payments of wages, compensations, and severance pay within 14 days after the cause of such payment occurred, which means um, you have to pay everything uh, within the 14 days after dismissal of your em employee. And um, you should make note that severance pay must be paid unconditionally um, um, for everyone, except for those who work less than 15 hours per week and those who have not worked for more than one year. And um, it is also important that severance pay should also be made for those who you're firing with justifiable reasons. So for example, you know, if there is an employee who worked at your company for more than one year and he got caught for embezzlement and was fired, you still have to pay him severance pay, reg regardless of the fact that you may claim compensation of damages to that employee. So, um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you have to be aware because you may be punished by law even and even go to jail for the discompliance of this act. So we talked about Article 23-2, 
which is dismissing an employee while they are on medical leave based on their work injury or you know they're on maternity leave. And this Article 26 is about the 30-day advance notice of the dismissal. So I think you know in Korea it's quite harsh that you can be imprisoned and even for like up to five years in prison for up to two years, um, even just be, um, you know, not um, just for violating um, or disregard for, you know, the procedures of dismissals. But, you know, in reality, uh, most in most cases, monetary punishments will be made, but, you, you know, you never know. And you should really be aware because, um, especially in terms when you're um, when your company is really growing vastly, then you really have to be aware of this you know two articles because um, that's what government is watching um, based on the Labor Act. And another uh, thing that you should know is there would be joint penalty and not only the offender but also the business owner can be punished together with the offender. Um, but this business owner um, may be only fined, not the that they're not going to jail. But in some cases, but but like you know, in most cases, the offender, because you're giving this dismissal notice with the name of the company, then the offender is the actually the CEO of the company. So actually, in um, this is the part where many foreign companies are quite surprised at. Um, because the offender, I mean the CEO of the company, can also be punished together with the offender who, I mean, who actually give gave that notice to the employee. So, um, so I'll make the recap, the final recap on what I have discussed today. So, in summary, um, there are four things that you have to remember in terms of this um, labor act. First, you have to provide a written agreement to the employee specifying his or her wage, working hours, holidays, annual paid leaves, working scope, places of work, and work rules. And second, you have to give a written notice of dismissal at least 30 days in advance. And that notice shall include justifiable grounds and timing of dismissal. And third, you can't just fire employees when they're on their sick leaves um, for work injury. And you can't fire um, employees who are on their maternity leave and within 30 days immediately thereafter. So, um, and you have to pay wages, compensation, and severance pays within 14 days after, within 14 days after one's dismissal. So that's it for today. And if you have any questions, you can ask me, just ask me now or email me at any time. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Hyunji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so now we are seven thirty-eight. So I will uh, cover the about the visa, maybe in like ten minutes or something, ten to fifteen minutes. And then the, if we still have a time, maybe we can have some Q and A session. We have more questions. May uh, you you guys always feel free to reach us. Okay, so I will share the screen. Can you guys uh, see the, uh, the my Canva presentation? Okay. 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 So before uh, we uh, start the presentation, just a little bit about myself. My name is Jay Kim. My name is Hyun Jiang in Korean. So nice to meet you, everyone. And then um, I'm running the company SaaS Ventures with Martha and Jihan. So SaaS Ventures, uh, so I am i don't work for Korean government. <laughs> I don't work for ministry, but uh, we do have a right from the Minister of the SME and Startup to run the uh, especially OASIS visa program, uh, which is a kind of foreign entrepreneur visa program on behalf of the ministry. So there's uh, something what we are doing. And then the reason why we are doing because uh, myself, I also lived in many countries doing the startup, uh, lots of adventures. Uh, I lived in, um, I spent my 30s in India for many years. So it's just very nice to uh, 
uh, C. Nitish. I don't know where you're from India, but your name sounds like Indian to me. And then I also uh, work and live in Singapore. I studied in France. And also I used to run the business in Africa in Madagascar. So I was a foreign entrepreneur in other country before I coming back to Korea. So after uh, back to Korea, and then I started to um, uh, connected to more uh, startup ecosystem, mainly community builders. That's how I met uh, Martha and Gian too. And then the, uh, last year, we, uh, as a small startup too, we really uh, tried to uh, find the business model, how we can have a more sustainable business model at the same time to help the, to bring the more uh, global startup to Korea. So we made a proposal to Korean government. And then uh, uh, luckily we uh, went through the Korea government system. So we were chosen uh, one of the, uh, only kind of company working with the Ministry of SME so far uh, to run the, uh, the startup, uh, uh, startup visa program. Okay, so uh, so uh, start, Korea startup visa, uh, usually we say OASIS visa. So uh, I don't think, uh, first of all, kind of I want to know that uh, if you guys have any visa problem here in Korea, if you do have, do you mind to just uh, kind of send in, like send in messages that you need a visa? or not, I think I also can see that many of you guys are actually uh, are whether Korean or maybe don't, uh, don't really live in Korea right now. So you don't really need this information right now, but uh, it's something it would be nice for you guys to know for the future. Or if you have a colleague or friends, maybe you guys can share too. Uh, whatever I'm sharing today, it's not 100% accurate in a way because Korean government, uh, they tend to change uh, many uh, policies and everything are together. But what I one certain thing what I know is that they are really, really uh, this year, they are ready to uh, change many policies and uh, kind of laws and stuff to bring more uh, foreign uh, entrepreneurs to Korea. So before I think, uh, you know, because of language issues and obviously worldview and everything was very different. So it was very difficult before, but now the Korea, they are making a like new K-Hub. I think it will open in June. I already meet the key people over there. And also they know that the visa, uh, visa status right now, it's not really a uh, foreigner friendly, especially foreigner entrepreneur friendly. So they are, I think, ready to change certain things. But again, uh, obviously visa is uh, governed by the Ministry of Justice, not by the SME and startup. So I think now they have a kind of in the negotiation term, how to change and everything. So. Uh, hopefully, I think everything work out uh, better for you guys. So anyway, so Korea Startup Visa is a foreigners who do learn, want to launch a business Korea based on the outstanding ideas and technologies. And then the, before you actually have a startup visa, there's another kind of temporary visa, which is a D10 to start a pre-visa, a pre-visa, like pre-startup visa, and then the, that you can apply. And then the, I can share more information too as well. So this is kind of a simple visual journey in a way. I think many of you guys, if you're already in Korea, most probably you came with a tourist visa. So uh, many nationalities, uh, you know, coming from North America or a couple of Asian country and European country, you guys can stay in Korea up to three months without any problem. But after tourist visa, you want to, or if you want to stay more longer than that, probably you did some visa trip to Japan and coming back or something like that. And then without a very certain, uh, kind of uh, income plans and everything, it's not really easy to uh, set up the business right away in Korea. So for those, I want to recommend you to uh, uh, apply for the D10-2, which is a startup pre-visa. Uh, you can apply, uh, when you apply, you can get a six months and then the, you can uh, renew for up to two years. But the, recently I saw the new stat, uh, another kind of D10 visa, I think you guys can stay up to three years. So maybe I think D10-2, I assume that you guys can uh, stay up to three years. Uh, without uh, before you actually apply for the startup visa. The problem with the D10 to visa, you it's more like temporary visa. So you need to apply visa every two months, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, you also um uh, you can only earn money in Korea officially because uh, it's a pre-startup visa. So maybe you will have a bank account, personal bank account, where you have to put your own money from the overseas, but you can only make a uh, money in Korea officially. But the startup visa, once you have, you have a company, your company can make a money. So there's just something different. I, want, I won't cover that much for now. Okay. 
So whatever, anyway, so I will talk about the OASIS program. The OASIS program, when you're taking, uh, you can save up the point up to three years. Maybe it sounds very foreign, but uh, I can tell you uh, more about it. Okay, so Korea is all about point system. <laughs> we love points in Korea. So the to, to, so to get a TA4, basically you need to collect the 80 OASIS points. So each OASIS program you take, and then they will give you a certificate. The certificate equivalent to certain points, and then the point system. So you have a, enough points, you get all those paper, whatever the ministry talk about, you go to the immigration center, and then you will get the startup visa. And D10 to pre-start the visa I was talking to you about, kind of a temporary visa. You take any of our OASIS program, just you finish one program, you are eligible to get the pre-start the visa. There are certain other uh, requirements with uh, like, like university degrees, etc. The one you guys can figure out from our website later. Okay, so this is kind of all uh, like entire OASIS. So there are like eight different OASIS. So there are OASIS one, two, three, et cetera. But our company, me and Marta, we run the company, uh, we run the OASIS four and five and eight. So OASIS one, two, three is your more related to the patent, uh, register patents, et cetera. And then there are some other stuff, but the, we are running the four and five and eight. So out of the eight, um, I can uh, tell you more about the, how the watches four they look like, for example. So watches four is just like basic startup class. So uh, this is like visa, again, it's not like startup program. So uh, the older subject is uh, defined by the means of the justice, you know, sounds like not very practical subject for the startup. So what our company did, we were trying to make it uh, more entrepreneur friendly as much as we can. And it's not too uh, boring. It's not, not too, uh, it's something useful for you guys in the future. So instead of the uh, just kind of the just lecture based uh, classroom, we really turn it to the more fun stuff. And then this is kind of what we are doing. So a uh, basic uh, OASIS, a uh, uh, basic startup class, we kind of, you come and develop an idea what is in Korea and also learn a certain new skill. And there's such a great time for you guys to come and meet the founder from the community from the, all over the world. And then the, we, uh, um, uh, it's a kind of 20 hours of the man, uh, mandatory uh, class. So while how the, the way how we are running doing, we run more like boot camp and hackathon style. So we always start from the Friday evening and then we are finishing the Sunday kind of afternoon time. So Friday, uh, we, uh, you guys come in and then we give you some like sandwich or something. And then we do a couple of our classes and then the Saturday and Sunday. So, mm -hmm. yes. So like this is kind of Friday roadmap and then usually uh, we start and then we always start with our like target marketing, marketing classes. And then you also can get to more, uh, know more about the Korea society and business culture. And the Saturdays are kind of the all day you guys are all together. So we, uh, as you say, we always run as more hackathon styles. So we cover the other subject because those subject is a uh, kind of uh, defined from the midst of the justice. But at the same time, we run more as a kind of business models and canvas, etc. So any anyone uh, who come to our uh, classes, maybe you guys don't have a certain idea or you guys come with a very vague idea about the certain businesses. And then we want to help you uh, uh, concrete your idea as much as we can. So the, la the, the last day, Sunday, when you are leaving, uh, you always go back with uh, more knowledge and skills. And also everyone, will, you will end up doing the like pitching to in front of everyone. So, uh, so far has been really great. And then the couple of participants in this room too, uh, we have a menu, we had a pleasure to meet you in the different cities in Korea. So this is kind of uh, the way how we are doing it. So this is just a little bit of the, so there are, I told you about there are watches one to eight. So each watch is there a point. So for example, the watches one is Beijing Church of Property Curse, 50 points. Uh, unfortunately, our company yet, we don't have a, a license to run the course yet. It's run by the other company who have a more pattern lawyers in Seoul. So, uh, so something like that, you guys can go it and then you get the 50 points. I told you to get a watches visa, you need the 80 points. So this is uh, kind of, you can do the small math here. So watches two is uh, another 25 points and then those are the 
uh, subject, uh, what they're covered during the OASIS. This is the OASIS 3. So basically OASIS 1, 2, 3 are related to the interactive property. So in Korea, once you prove that you have an IP or a certain pattern, they give you a lecture point and then this is how they work. And then the so OASIS 3, actually, once you are lucky enough to get the OASIS 3, then the, they, they have a actually monetary support from the government. So they subsidize you the money when you apply for the patent in Korea. So pet, to apply patent, I don't know about your country in Korea, it can be pretty expensive too. So the application cost and et cetera, easily it can, um, um, it costs about like kind of $3,500 or something. But uh, if you take a watch is three and then there are a certain budget, I think they cover like 50% of it. That's how I know. This is uh, from us, watch is four. So you come and then uh, spend your 20 hours with us on the weekend, you can get a 25 points. And then another one to watch is five years are running it. It's a very easy certificate to get it. It's a 50 point, six hours of the mentoring. So usually we run on Saturday. So Saturday, like from the nine o'clock to like 3 p.m. So you come and meet the, our mentors, in-house mentors. You uh, talk about your businesses and get some help. Like today, Hyunju was here. So we also have a lawyer. Uh, we also have a VC and different, you know, mentors for the startup. Uh, you come and spend some time with them. And then at the end of the day, we give you a certificate. This certificate, this OSH5 certificate is eligible for you to apply for the uh, pre-startup visa. This is a startup six, and this is another one seven. And uh, OASIS eight is when you actually establish your company, uh, register your company, they give you 15 points. So anyway, to uh, to have OASIS visa, you need a company to run. So I told you we need 80 points. So always you can get up to 65 points and you can leave another 50 points. Once you register your company, automatically you will get a 15 points. And there is the OASIS uh, 9 is another 25 points. So this is a kind of a requirement uh, to get a D10 too. So there will be a visa application form, et cetera. Often um, we need a degree certificate. And then the, unfortunately uh, in Korea, if you didn't graduate the university, uh, you, can have, you, can have, you are not eligible to apply for the D10 too. Um, which I don't, I find this is not make a sense in a way. So, uh, so I already, uh, we already filed a certain uh, kind of uh, request uh, letter to the ministry officially. See that there are many uh, uh, bright and good entrepreneurs from overseas. They tend not to uh, graduate the university nowadays. So the please give us exception how they can apply visa and stuff. So hopefully I hope the Korean government they make us some action this year so that the without degree to uh, you guys can apply. But so far opposite, uh, you know, the degree certificate is the must thing to apply for the startup pre-visa. And then you take any of the OASIS program, four or five, you guys, uh, you guys are eligible to apply for the D10 to here in Korea. So many people, they come to Korea, they come into Korea with a tourist visa, and then now they change to D10 too. And many of our friends and many of them from our community successfully, they got the D10 to visa. D4 is the technology business startup visa. So this one, again, uh, you need a uh, like degree and 80 more points. So from the point, a point chart, you guys can study about it. So this is a kind of point chart. Um, um, is a kind of a, there are like compulsory one. So as you say in the, the first table here, at least one item is required. But, uh, and then the program, for example, uh, what we are running, or is it four or five is elective item. So doesn't, it cannot become a one of the compulsory item as a, the first table. So one you guys can do, always you guys can uh, apply for the patent. Apply for the patent itself, actually they give you the point. You don't have to own the pattern yet because it take a while. So something like that, you guys can do it. Or exception cases, or if you stay in the e, uh, a three years visa in the E3 and certain thing. But what I know is that someone like you, especially you guys come into the SCAP program and then they're really eager to bring more uh, very qualified uh, foreign startup. So what I know the ministry, they are on the way to change a certain point system to give the some exception point for you guys. So hopefully everything will come out this year. So if you uh, want to stay in Korea with a DA4, I think it will be uh, easier than the last year. 
This is a couple of photos of what we did. So we did in July in Busan. Uh, me and Martha, we live in Busan. We love Busan so much. So we uh, really hope we can run more OASIS uh, program uh, this year in Busan too. This is a couple of our photos. And also we went to Daejeon. So Daejeon, there are many smart people in Korea. So we had a privilege to run in the Tips town. And also we were running in the makerspace in Daejeon. So we also had a lot of interaction with the local entrepreneurs. So what we are doing, uh, Obviously, it's a government-run program, but we want to make it fun and more useful for you guys as much as we can, unless the kind of uh, we don't really break the law. Sometimes they come and interfere so much, so we cannot change that much. But uh, this is how we are doing. So this is the WASHIS program from Daejeon, and also we are running Daegu, and then the, hopefully we can run more this year. And then there are some other visa too. So there are D8, the visa, uh, visa, the which investment visa. So this is not really run by the Ministry of the SME. It's a more, I think the kind of COTRA, there are some other ministry they are running this visa. So officially you put the more than um, kind of uh, equivalent to 80, uh, 85,000 US dollar capital. Uh, from the beginning when you sell the company, uh, at the same time, you own more than 10% of the share, you are eligible for the D8 uh, visa, investment visa. But this is different the D8 for our OSIS way what we are talking about. So there are always obviously student visa is a good option nowadays. Many of the startup people, they are studying in Korea at the same time, they are kind of a uh, they are running their own startup too because often Korean university now they start to give more funding, etc. for the especially for foreign students. So there will be more opportunity in the future. So there are new visa came K culture visa or workation visa, like digital nomad visa. I think you need to prove that you need to earn more than 66,000 a year to stay in Korea. So this visa also you guys can renew up to two years. If you know, if you want to see more information, you can go to the website and also Martha just shared a uh, link with you guys. And then, the, yes, that's it for, yes, that's it from, from my side. If you have any question about the visa, you guys can ask or we almost uh, hitting the APM. So maybe you can get, we can get one question. Martha, what do you think? And then we can finish today's session. Um, yeah, so um, do you, well, first of all, do you have any questions about all the presentations that you heard today? Feel free to ask around. All questions allowed, almost. Uh, yeah, for, for, the, for the visa part. Uh, so, Jakim, you said like uh, if we are in the D102 visa preparation, we can we can't basically earn money from working in Korea. But I was wondering if we can basically work for for uh, overseas company and earn money on our own uh, in mm -hmm. the meanwhile of starting the business. Yes, technically you can. So, for example, if you are you have you are French, right? So you yeah. come into Korea, you take uh, our OASIS program, and then the, you will be eligible to apply for D10 too, which as uh, so you have no problem to stay in Korea. Yeah. Does it mean uh, that means that you cannot earn the money officially in Korea, but uh, your company in France will pay you the salary into your uh, French account, and then you withdraw the money in Korea using the money to be in Korea. There will be no problem. Okay, okay. That's your question, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good scenario. I think that is pretty cool, you know? And then the the visa people, immigration people, they don't really understand the characteristic of the startup. So it's not something we don't want to make money, but unless we don't get the funding, there is a funding or investment. There's no way we can pay ourselves, you know? So it's just, uh, yeah, I think the, that's how you can use the detent to visa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Any other questions? If not, uh, so we'll send you the presentation decks uh, soon via email. So don't worry, you'll, you'll have all the information. Uh, th like I said, there'll be a continuation of these presentations uh, later down the line uh, with more detailed stuff. There was a question from Pablo. I don't know if Pablo is here. Pablo is here about uh, uh, soft landing resources and funding for global startups. 
There are only the three programs other than the startup visa. These are the only three programs from the government that I mentioned. Uh, details about them will be announced. Well, in case of the scouting program very soon, in case of case startup grand challenge uh, in April, in case of, um, of, uh, um, which was the last one? Oh, this global startup center will be in June. So uh, keep your eyes and ears open. And if you're interested, join soulstartups.com. I publish these uh, programs every, the second they get announced. So you'll be the first one to know about them there. In that case, um, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure as always. Uh, feel free to contact us with any questions um, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. We'll also send you a recording of this. So, so if you missed the beginning or, or you, you know, you, you're wandered off for a minute in the middle, don't worry, you'll have it all uh, in your inbox very soon. Okay, can I suggest one thing? Do you mind just turn on the camera? We need one screenshot to prove that you guys are here today. So if you can uh, show your beautiful oh, yeah. faces. And then the Chihang can take a screenshot. Everyone we say kimchi and then let's take a photo and then let's share leave. Is that good? Jong Ma Kruni and Jay Kim. If you can too, that'd be amazing. Thank you, thank you. Oh, there's two Jay Kims. Yeah, yeah. People are confused a little bit. Mostly Jay Kim is your male name, except me so far. What I I met. Okay. So except John, probably. Okay. So everyone, let's say kimchi. 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 Okay. Thank you so much. See you Thank next you. time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.